So we basically did all the normal stuff about what an action potential is, what a normal muscular junction is, the purpose of acetylcholinesterase. Now, to make sure you understand it, to give this normal stuff meaning, I gotta put the diseases in here. It also makes it a little bit more fun for you and I, all right? Not just for me, okay? So it's all based on this area here, what I drew up on the board. Who here has heard of myasthenia gravis, MG? A few of you, okay. And if you haven't, you will, because this is a good example of how the neuromuscular juncture uh, takes place. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease, meaning, as we talked about autoimmune diseases, it's a, something that's going to attack your own body. Your body makes antibodies to attack its own self. In this, in, in, I showed you rheumatoid arthritis, it attacks the joints. I showed you about multiple sclerosis, it makes antibodies, autoantibodies that attack the, um, the, the myelin that's on the nerves. In this case, we have someone who has myosthenia gravis is gonna make autoantibodies to attend receptors, the red little receptors over here, okay? So there are antibodies. Why, we, why the person makes them, we don't know. But what's it gonna do? It's going to take some of these, internalize it. It's going to, and let's say the, um, the autoantibodies, they're shaped like little Ys, and they attach over here so that acetylcholine can't get there. They bring this whole thing inwards and destroy the receptors. So now acetylcholine comes out and has no place to go. Would you have a contraction there or would you not have a contraction there? No contraction. So they have what we call flaccid paralysis or spastic paralysis. Is it flaccid or spastic? Flaccid. Flaccid, okay? No tone whatsoever, okay? So it results in this progressive weakness and fatigue of skeletal muscles. Starts in the face, works its way down. They have problems swallowing. They have problems keeping their, eye, or keeping their eyes open. We call that ptosis. But they, you know, yes, and they open their eyes, and all of a sudden one eye is like drooping. We call that ptosis, okay? Uh, they have difficulty moving their eyes. You make this big letter H in their view over here, and they have to try and follow it with their fingers, and they're like, they can't do it. It hurts because their eye muscles get too fatigued. Usually death because the respiratory muscles are affected, the diaphragm. So this is what normally happens. You see it over there. Here's the axon terminal. These red things over here are the receptors for acetylcholine. These purple things are the acetylcholine. In a case where myosin and gravis, they produce these autoantibodies that bind to the receptors, internalize them, and destroy the receptors. So now you have less receptors out here, so the acetylcholine has no place to go. So you're not going to allow sodium to come in because the Acetylcholine receptors are not going to be uh, triggered. Okay? So it just gets internalized and then get destroyed inside. And there's another picture showing the same thing. This is what ptosis is. It's spelled like this with P is silent. They look up and all of a sudden, you know, one or both eyelids start dro drooping. You should be able to hold it up for at least 10 or 20 seconds. These people, it's much shorter than that. All right? So the treatment, the treatment of this is, well, the, the goal or the, the theory about this, the goal is that if there's a way that we could actually put more acetylcholine in this area, that hopefully this acetylcholine, since we have a lot more of it in here, it'll hopefully knock off those autoantibodies because we have a lot more acetylcholine than there is with the autoantibodies. So that's the goal. So what is one way that we can actually make more acetylcholine appear there? Or maybe, let me put it this way, 
how can we make sure that the acetylcholine stays there, it doesn't go away? What can we do? What's going to, all right, normally, what's going to make the acetylcholine go away? Acetylcholine esterase. So why don't we get a medication that's going to block this? to allow more acetylcholine to stay in that area, you see? So the goal is that, and how do we do it? We have cholinesterase inhibitors. And that's going to keep more of the acetylcholine in that area to hopefully knock off those autoantibodies. They flood the receptors, okay? That's the theory how they're trying to do this. And it works out pretty good. There's other things, but it doesn't work out. But this is their main goal. Okay? Questions about that? All right? All right. This is what I'm trying to show. The disease is, is giving this stuff meaning. Don't memorize it. Understand the, how the diseases work. That's going to reinforce to make sure you understand this concept over here. Instead of you just forgetting about what this concept is and then relearning it later on in your career. You don't want to relearn it. You want to review it. There's a big difference between reviewing and relearning. These diseases will help you to remember them. We have neuromuscular toxins, pesticides. Pesticides are cholinase inhibitors. So what's going to happen here is that these pesticides will bind to the acetylcholinesterase and make them not work. Now, I'm not talking about Monastain and Gravis. We're done with that. But in another thing, you breathe in this pest, these pesticides. Some of them be toxins, right? And what's going to happen here is the acetylcholine esterase is not going to work, which means that these acetylcholine green dots are going to stay on the receptors for a longer amount of time. So if they stay on it for a longer amount of time, are you going to have a continuous amount of action potentials on the muscle or not enough? Continuous. Does that mean the person's going to have a spastic paralysis or plastic? Spastic. You see what I'm saying? It makes sense. Okay? And they usually die of possible suffocation. Chiari. Anybody's heard of Chiari? You probably, yeah, a couple of you's heard. But they're also in the movies, but they don't say the word Chiari. But you see in uh, South America, they have these little, uh, uh, it's the natives over there, they have little darts and, and it shoots them in the, in the neck and they fall over. There's a movie with uh, uh, The Rock uh, a, a few years ago. It's not The Rock anymore, what's his name? Yeah, Dwayne Rundown. Johnson, right. What's that? Rundown. Yeah, I think it was Rundown. And what it was was uh, there was a native that, yeah, what's that? Yeah, the monkeys? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he was shot by one of these, and he's like, what is that? All of a sudden, he falls over. And now he's aware of everything. His eyes are open, and his little monkeys are going around. And like, I don't know, he's behind me. He's doing something behind me, but he can't move. You see, the way Kiari works is that it blocks acetylcholine esterases. I'm sorry, it, it blocks acetylcholine receptors. So it's going to put a block here. So acetylcholine still comes out, but it can't attach to the receptor here. So if this, if you block the receptors, are they going to have a spastic paralysis or flaccid? Flaccid. And that's what happened in the movie. It just like heals over and it loses its, its uh, potential after like, I guess a couple hours or whatever, and then you can move around. But we actually still use Chiari as a muscle relaxant just before we go, we, you go under the um, uh, anesthesia for any kind of surgery. Some doctors still use the Chiari. A certain dosage, you don't make a big dosage, but that's what they use it on. Okay? Questions about Chiari? Okay? The black widow spider, hey! The black widow spider, there's a venom in there called Latraxin. Latraxin is the venom, and it's going to stimulate a whole mess, well, God bless you, a whole mess of acetylcholine release from the presynaptic cleft. 
I'm sorry, a presynaptic membrane. So you can have a lot of these green dots going out there. Is that going to cause spastic paralysis or plastic? Spastic. You're getting the hang of it. Right? Does that make sense? So yeah, maybe they're doing some kind of research and using latraxin, black widow spider venom, for mastina gravis. Because that's going to flood this area with a lot of acetylcholine. See? That's what you got to do. You got to put the stuff together. Okay? So that's what a black widow spider bite looks like. Here it is, uh, initial bite in three hours and three days. I mention this because this is one of the two of spiders that are deadly in, in North America. What's the other deadly one we got to watch out for? Not, no, tarantula is not uh, poisonous at all. I mean, unless you're allergic to it like bee stings. I mean, bee sting is not allergic unless you got a whopping amount of venom in there, and you know that'll just do it. Or you're allergic to it. But tarantulas, they aren't poisonous unless you get a lot of venom. In there. But what's the other one besides the black widow spider? You just need a drop, and this will start doing it. Yeah, the brown recluse. All right, the brown recluse doesn't cause any neurological things, but I'll put it up here just as an FYI because most students do ask about the brown recluse. The brown recluse, what that does, it causes more of the GI symptoms. You know, gastrointestinal, they get nausea, they get vomiting, that kind of stuff. But the thing that we are more concerned about than losing a lot of water is necrosis. They get a lot of dead tissue where the bite happens, and it happens very rapidly. How you can tell about the, um, the brown recluse? Now, this here, the black widow spider, they have this ominous little red hourglass that happens on the bottom of the belly. So you can't see it on the top. And most people, they say, oh, I just got bit. And it's the first thing to do is stomp on it. Now I can't tell what it is. You know what I'm saying? You got to look on the bottom. But it has this hourglass that's over here. For the brown recluse, it's brown. And they have different sizes. The legs are pretty long on this. Okay? But they have, we have what's known as the violin shape on its, its back. You see how it looks like a violin? There's the stem, and here's the part where you do strum. Well, not strum, but that kind of thing. You see the violin shape? But again, most people will do that after they get bit. I can't tell what it is then. All right? So that's what happens over here. So you see this. And you can see, here's three days, here's nine days, and here's, you know, like almost uh, just over a month. It rapidly goes there. We have to try and... You know, salvage it, try to treat it, but it's hard to treat. And that's what happens. All right. Again, I won't ask you about the brown recluse. I just put it there as an FYI because students ask about that. Okay. What about other infections that affect the neuromuscular junction? Well, polio also affects here upstreams a little bit. Um, it's a virus that attacks the motor neurons upstream, and we'll, where the spinal cord is. We'll talk about that when we get into the spinal cord, but I wanted to put it in here because it does affect it somewhat over here. Tetanus is also another one that's caused by a bacteria. Um, and this one suppresses the inhibitory mechanism of motor neurons. We'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but this also would cause a spastic paralysis. Um, you step on a rusty nail, there, you know, our question is, did you get tetanus shot lately? Okay, it's, it's for this. Now, tetanus, and I'll show you what it looks like. Tetanus is not, like, I mean, it's spastic, but it's not, um, not like this. All right? Or it is like this, but it stays like that. I have a video, uh, let me show you, of uh, the dog's name. We don't see it often in America because the old people will get the tetanus shots. All right? Dogs, however, we do see it more often in, in our uh, country because they step on things that we don't know about it. So I was able to find this little short video about what tetanus is because I want you to see, because this makes it look very scary. I mean, to know that you have tetanus is scary, but that looks like, oh my God, the guy's having a convulsion, right? <laughs> so, but this is what it really looks like. It's sad, but um, actually, uh, I think the dog's name was Mickey. And um, after about 30 days, 30 or 40 days, it went right back to normal, but it took a long time. But I want you to see what it is. They're just very stiff, and but they're aware of everything. Yeah.
this dog suffers from the most horrible disease that we have in the animal kingdom from our point of view. He has tetanus, an infection with Clostridium tetany. It's completely stiff. He's like this now for two days. If he survives another five days, he can get better. But I'm honestly not very hopeful. We have to keep him hydrated. We have to try and feed him. And we have to turn him around regularly so he doesn't get wound on one side. He got some tetanus serum, he got some antibiotics, and he's on a sedative in a dark room with not too much noise. And the most horrible thing in this disease is that he's completely aware of what is happening. He can hear us, he can see us. It's just stiff. That's what tetanus is. We don't see it much in America because we have the tetanus or booster shot for that. Um, question about tetanus? All right. Botulism, another one from bacteria. Botulism, we see it in a lot like food poisoning. Okay. Botulism um, blocks the release of acetylcholine. So it's going to block this from occurring. So if we don't have much acetylcholine over there, nothing's really going to bind to the acetylcholine receptors. Are they going to have a spastic paralysis or flaccid? Flaccid. Do you see how you're putting this stuff together? Okay. Now botulism uh, is also can be found in honey and it's also can be found in canned food. Now, adults and um, older children, maybe like teenagers and stuff, are um, uh, their immune system is pretty strong. But toddlers and babies, their immune system is not really adequate. So this is the reason why you don't give honey to babies. Who here has heard of that? All right. Now you're all aware of it. So when you become mommies and daddies, don't give honey to children. That's the reason why. It's because that you need to, um, just in case there is botulins in there, our bodies can fight against it easily. Babies can't. So I would know that if I were you. Hint, hint. Okay? All right. Um, God bless you. And then we have Botox, which I don't know much about, but it relaxes muscles so that you don't have those wrinkles that are always over there. So that's what Botox. I'm not putting no botulism in my face, but some people... Oh, kind of cute, you know, that kind of thing, I don't know. All right, um, so that's what that is, okay? So this is just kind of showing you in different places. Polio is much higher upstream, we'll talk about that later. Uh, tetanus is over here, botulism, myosin, and gravis affects the neuromuscular junction at that level over here, okay?